Good morning. Welcome to another session of hashtag LD Edu Chat Leadership Development in Education. And what a fantastic session we have for you today. Rolling off the sessions that we've done before, we've looked at with the Sif Sadiq about diverse um, teams, and we've done quite a lot on inclusion and about representation and obviously our webinar which we did it's two weeks ago today actually we did our uh, webinar on black lives matter and anti-racism about it being a whole school responsibility and quite a lot's happened since then there's been many 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 schools and trusts and ceos that have now been in touch and organizations in terms of how can we support each other to make sure we have this collaborative inclusive uh, whichever words you want to use, um, diverse cultures within our schools from a curriculum point of view, from a, a workforce point of view, and how do we embed ourselves within our communities? And again, that challenge of being part of the community, the hub, is something that um, we were also looked at. Uh, yesterday, Sarah Owen MP, who chaired that session, she also raised that within the chamber and highlighted uh, Gwyneth Gibson. Uh, Lee Manor and the work that we've done as Chiltern Learning Trust in actually trying to deal with this really challenging topic that we're faced with in terms of having everybody having a sense of belonging within the school, whether you're a student or whether you're a, a member of the staff uh, in, that, in that school and organisation. That sense of belonging is something that I think we are all striving for, no matter what your background or heritage is. And um, the conversations are now happening, uh, which is really, really good to see. Today, we have Amjad Ali, who is one of the co-founders of uh, Baymed uh, Network in the UK, and uh, that has done an immense amount of work as an organization and as an individual to raise this issue for the last few years he'll be looking at how do we create how do we create that diverse team within our schools and also lots of points of reflection within that um, there will be various links in the session um, which will be shared online on our twitter and i'll put them together and send them out in our follow-up email as well so you've got them as a reference point for you to do some uh, do some further reading and exploration of those issues right so let's jump straight to amj Jad's presentation and then we'll have a live Q&A after the session. Hello and welcome to this session from Baymed around recruiting a diverse team. I want to use the next 25 to 30 minutes to give you lots and lots of food for thought, highlight and signpost any uh, relevant resources and any relevant places that you could go to find out more information, but ultimately to give you some ideas and some thinking processes around recruiting a diverse team. My name is Amjad Ali. I'm one of the co-founders of the Baymed Network, a grassroots organization developed and designed around helping to address the ethnic imbalance between people in positions of power and in positions of leadership across the education sector primarily. The topic of today is how do we recruit a diverse team? Lots and lots of responses and lots and lots of queries get sent to the Baymed network around how do we get more diverse people in? How do we get more diversity in our organisation? So I want to chuck through for you some ideas, some suggestions and some hopefully some guiding principles for you to think about in terms of recruiting a diverse team. So with that in mind, let's think about what are the actual issues. When we're thinking about the issues, you're thinking about, well, ultimately, we want the very best for our students. We want the very best for our organization. We want the very best talent within our organizations. And in order to do that, we need to think, how can we reach all the talent pools that are out there. So you're committed to raising aspirations for all of your students. One of your challenges is that you're, when it comes to race, there's often disparity in representation, not just visual um, disparity in representation. So I'm not just talking about people of color exclusively, but ethnic minorities within that. So for example, Romani gypsy traveler um, teachers, what are the representations of those despite them looking white, just like um, the majority of teachers? Such as in the staffing of your school, you're also keen to overcome these issues around diversity and navigating a mindful surrounding it, but maybe you don't know where to start. Maybe you don't know how to build on this movement that has really taken over the world, and this is the stepping stone or the starting point for you, which is fantastic. Let's think about how we can move that forward. 
So here are a couple of big questions for us to consider. Is the current recruitment and progression process in our profession working? If you think it is working, do you have a diverse, organized, a diverse hierarchy, a diverse leadership, a diverse structural system within your school? And do we value the difference in voice in our profession? When I say in voice in terms of who are the people that are giving us the representative ideas, who are the people that are telling us what we should be doing, who are the people that are guiding us in terms of where we are. So those are our two big questions for you to consider. Lots and lots of reflection points. Obviously as this is recorded feel free to pause, feel free to think, feel free to discuss um, and feel free to chuck us some questions, some tweets at the Baymed Network using the hashtag Baymed for us to respond as and where applicable. So the SWAN report, um, one of many reports um, that's been filtered through the education system and filtered through um, corporate systems in ensuring to us that actually multiculturalism um, and diversity and therefore the lack of it is still a significant problem. The Runnymede Trust has um, published lots of further documentation that shows that this is a systemic issue, this is a problem, and this is something that we haven't overcome. I know through my interactions with many, many people on Twitter, people are saying there's been reports for a long time, there's been report after report after report, but what are the physical, active, tangible measures that we are putting in place to overcome these difficulties that many of us, especially me as a member of the BAME community, black, Asian, minority or ethnic or however you like to be preferred, we use BAME as a administrative collective point, viewpoint as opposed to an individualized othering of people. However you like to be preferred, what are we going to be doing about it? Something that stood out for me in the Swan Report is this quote, multicultural understanding must permeate all aspects of a school's work. It is not a separate topic that could be welded onto existing practices. And that kind of formulates the basis behind my entire talk, really. It's the idea of whatever you're going to take from this, this isn't about a bolt on, this isn't about a review of let's think about how we can become more diverse in what we're already doing. This is about how can we make diversity a cultural element of our school? How can we make it so ingrained that actually you don't need to talk about what diversity is? Very much similar to my background is in inclusion and send. It's very much similar to that. If we're truly inclusive, we don't talk about being inclusive. We just are inclusive. So this one report, links provided for you, have a read, talks very strongly about the need for multiculturalism and the difficulties that people of colour, BAME, black, Asian, minority, ethnic suffer whilst working in a school environment. So that, that's the problem. But then you might think, well, why do we need to bother? Especially if you firmly believe that you simply recruit the best talent in your fields. If you use language such as we don't see colour, we only see what's necessary for the application process. Or if you use language like it's a team fit, cultural approach, I can see them fitting into the system, they remind me of me, they're very similar to how I used to be when I was younger and all of those kind of things. Now you might mindlessly or innocently or inadvertently or subconsciously use this phrasing to suggest that there isn't a problem in your organization. However, what we need to think about very clearly is that the problem might just be the inherent bias within the system, the bias that you might not be aware of, the bias that might be hidden, or some people use the term unconscious in the system. And also we need to be very clear about the systemic racism that is evident across very many facets of our at least British systems of governance, British systems of support mechanisms within our country. So if you think there isn't a problem, then you need to step back and think, well, what is the current situation in my establishment? If you're a multi-academy trust, if you're a single school, if you're a local authority school, a maintained school, FE, HE, whatever you are, whoever you are, what's the current situation? At this point, you need to pause and think, do I know if it's bias? If it's bias and it's inherent and it's subconscious, how will I be able to determine whether there is a bias? I mean, starting point might be to think about whether this kind of language is used. Because often when people say, we only recruit the best, are you thinking about the process of meritocracy? Lots of BAME people might argue, actually, isn't it a meritocracy? Where people think the very best should look, act, walk, feel, sound like those people. And then is there a case of people are thinking of assimilation rather than me and my individualization? 
So with that in mind, let's think about, okay, so if those are the problems, what can we do about it? There's lots and lots of organizations that invested heavily in unconscious bias training. This piece of research that I've highlighted for you talks about sometimes pointless diversity training actually goes against the whole principles of inclusivity and diversity elements being enhanced within your organization. For example, one of the biggest biases around unconscious bias training is people often leave thinking, well, if it's unconscious, I haven't done anything wrong. Therefore, how can I fix something that is unconscious? Also, if something was unconscious and now it's been made conscious to you, the next time you do those things, it's intentional bias then, isn't it? Then we've got a bigger problem. And therefore, we want to leave that boxed into the unconscious bias element as opposed to a biased element. So diversity training. You need to seek out the very best. You need to seek out why, what's the aim, what's the goal. So think about Simon Sinek's golden circle and think about starting with the why. Why are we looking at this? Then you go to the how and then you go to the what, not the other way around. What are we trying to fix? How are we trying to do it? Why do we want to do it? Start with the why. What's your why around doing this? Then how, how do we do this? Then what is it that we're doing? So consider that in great detail. And then you need to consider the outcome of diversity or diverse organizations are significantly more profitable and significantly more um, responsive to the current situations that they're designed to be in. So the McKinsey report suggests very clearly that diversity within an organization is far more beneficial than a monocultural organization. So the graphic that I'm sharing with you there is that um, BAME colleagues or BAME people represent 13% of the population as per the McKinsey report and yet they represent 7% of executive team positions and 11% of board directors. Now minority on board of directors, 11% minority on executive team, 7%. So you might argue well actually that's not that far off the percentage population. But then when we think about this in terms of education, the numbers drop rapidly. The number of BAME head teachers is below 300. And on the BAME Ed website, you could find further stats on the workforce census documentation that the DFE provide. So there's a problem, the Swan report. We might not feel there's a problem, my personal bias. And McKinsey report stating that actually if you do have a diverse cultural team, a diverse in ideas, diverse in approach, diverse in physical diversity, you will be more profitable. So what can we do about it? We need to also be really mindful that diversity isn't just about me, i.e. people of colour. It's not just about simply whether you're black, white or Asian. Diversity is intersectional. There are many strands of diversity that we need to be aware of. Now some organisations are more comfortable with addressing some elements. So for example gender imbalance is a physical element that can be monitored and dealt with in quite clear ways. However, with the intersectionality of BAME, for example, a minority ethnic individual might not be visibly able to be differentiated. And therefore, what does that diversity element look like within your situation? Stats show in the workforce census that around one in four primary school students in the next um, coming years will be from a BAME background and around one in three will be in a secondary school setting. Therefore, we need to then think about if over 90% of the teachers and over 90% of the leaders within those areas are all from one cultural reference. What message does that pass on to our students? How do we get the best resource and the best entertainment and the best outcomes for our students? Professor Paul Miller asks us to reflect on our organisation through using these four frameworks. He talks about the idea that if you're engaged, if you're referencing yourself as engaged within diversity and inclusion, then your BAME staff are represented at all levels. Now I'm not just talking about executive leadership, CEO levels, you're represented at all levels. There isn't a disparity or uh, an over-representation in some elements. If you're experimenting, you have a few BAME staff at all levels. So some people, some organisational elements have an experimenting element of diversity and inclusion. If you're initiated, you have the frameworks in place. You may have the policies that I'm going to touch on later, but only a few staff. Now, lots of people would argue they're initiated because they want the diversity. They say they have the frameworks, but yet they can't get the staff. 
I would argue, are the frameworks accurate then? Are the frameworks inviting those members of staff in that way? And lastly, if you're uninitiated, you have no frameworks, you have no staff representing your communities, no element of inclusion within those communities, especially if your communities are, by definition, very diverse. So at this point, I would suggest that you pause the video, you think about this, you think about your um, institution, you think about where you are, and think about what we can do to resolve these situations and move upwards if you're starting on four to go to three to go to two and get to the ultimate aim of number one. First thing that we've got to do is we've got to look inwards first. So lots of self-reflection, lots of reviewing, lots of relearning and unlearning. Now what I mean by this is lots of us people of colour, BAME individuals will say it's not for me to constantly drive forward this message. It's not for me to constantly say hey this needs to happen. For example, a personal anecdote of mine would be if being invited out for a meal out with friends, I shouldn't constantly be the one that's saying, is that restaurant halal? Would I be able to eat at this restaurant? It should be for the people that know me, for the people that value me, for the people that appreciate me for who I am to say, Amjad, and we're also going here because it is halal. Because it's the same way we wouldn't exclude someone for being vegetarian, yet those kind of things are often missed out. So we've got to learn for ourselves. We've got to understand. So relearn and unlearn are really important. Unlearn some of the practices, some of the language that we've used. Unlearn some of the thought processes that we've been involved in for us to review and self-evaluate. Once we've looked inwards, we've then got to think about very clearly, right from the very top, our HR processes, our human resources processes. What are your processes? What are your frameworks? What are your policies? What are your guiding documentations? What are they in terms of allowing for diversity and inclusion and recruiting a diverse team. If you think your processes are fully initiated and fully engaged yet you're not getting the staff, we need to consider is that not a sign of whether those policies are effective or not? Or do they need reviewing, reshaping, reforming in some way? Quality Act 2010 lists nine protected characteristics. As I mentioned about intersectionality, we need to be aware of how these Equality Act protected characteristics feed into our HR processes. How do any of the things that we do as part of our organisation hinder or enhance these protected characteristics? We would prefer to have them enhancing the needs and the requirements and the stipulations within these protected characteristics rather than hindering the need, the requirement and the stipulation. From the Equalities Act, there are four types of discrimination that all of our processes and our organisations and our institutions should be aware of. And we provided a link there for you to look at four types of discrimination. So there's direct, indirect harassment and victimisation. Now these seem like intense words and you might think, well, no, my organisation isn't involved in these things. But we need to consider what the definitions of these things are to understand whether we are actually involved either subconsciously or overtly within these things. And then if we are, to learn, unlearn, review, reflect, evaluate, and then think about how we can move those things forward. I was posed this question by a colleague, a former head teacher of mine, that said that lots of people will say that there is a recruitment crisis in education, and lots of people would argue that the problem with education right now is not so much that um, there isn't a diversity within the teaching force, but we can't get the teaching force. I would say that's kind of part and parcel more this. Do we not have a talent spotting crisis instead? Instead of a recruitment crisis, do we not have a talent spotting crisis where people, individuals, are not being shown that teaching as a profession is a effective, worthwhile profession? We've had long-standing ideologies around teaching being a vocation and us investing our entire life within this job, i.e. the analogy of a candle burning away to light the path for others. Yes, teaching is a vocation. Yes, teaching is important, but ultimately it's a job. It's a job that we want us to be successful in, we want respect in, and we want effective remuneration in. So we need to consider if there's a talent spot in crisis, how can we get that talent through our doors? We need to think about our application process. Who's promoting our applications? Who's promoting the adverts that are going out there? I know, for example, if I saw BAME colleagues representing, advertising, highlighting, and promoting a job, 
I would be more inclined to think that that would obviously be more applicable or more acceptable for me to go for because a member of my BAME community is already within that situation. How do you get involved in who's promoting? When the TES or other organizations are promoting your adverts, what does it look like? What's your interview process? Who's on the interview panel? Who is sitting on these panels and what are their subconscious viewpoints around what a good leader looks like? I'm talking physically as well. Have you had those discussions around those things? Do we understand how some people can be hindered and subconsciously make stereotypical judgments around people instantly? There's various reports out there that show that applications with a predominantly Muslim name will be disregarded more despite having the same experience or qualifications as a non-Muslim name. So are there pros and cons around blind applications or is it just seen as a fad? What is your current system? How do you currently work around these problems? All elements for you to reflect and think on when thinking about how to recruit a diverse team. There's lots of uh, ways that you could promote your school. I used to work at a school in Oxford called Cheney School. And one of the most powerful uh, messages that our colleagues shared was the fact that we are such a diverse team. If we notice the opening um, element of the video. The thing that's really amazing about Cheney School is how diverse the school is. Now, at the time, I thought, absolutely, it's fundamentally diverse. We had something like 46 first languages spoken across the school. And I thought this is a brilliant video clip to promote the diversity in our school. However, on reflection, in hindsight, I thought maybe actually, wouldn't the diversity of the diversity be more applicable here? Shouldn't we be promoting the diversity stronger in our optics, in our ways, in our understanding? Who should be the first person that comes up on our video clips, on our promotional documentations? That's not to say we move away completely from any person that isn't um, BAME from our application processes or our advertising or our marketing, but it's for us to be aware of who and what is marketing and what that marketing looks like. We also need to consider what the language that we use looks like in our recruitment processes. So for example, this is from my current school when our former head teacher was recruiting a team um, before we opened up as a school. School pledges. What are your school pledges? Do you represent the diversity, the protected characteristics, the intersectionality of inclusion within the language? Just that very statement. We welcome applicants from underrepresented groups, including ethnicity, gender, transgender, age, disability, sexual orientation or religion, made me more wanting to apply because there is an element of understanding, there's an element of promoting, and there's an element Element of realization. So we need to consider, are you understanding, are you promoting and are you realizing what you need to do to promote and understand and realize a diverse team? Other things for you to do. Now, like I said, I, I mentioned that I'm one of the co-founders of the BAME Ed Network. Now, bamednetwork.com has tons and tons of free resources for you to consider, for you to use, for you to really, really delve into. Absolutely free, no sign up, no registration, no fees whatsoever. Have a look at the resources section. Within the resources section, we've got various blogs, articles, statistics, latest news, how you could get involved. You could explore data, policy, research, podcasts, videos, books. We've even got a speakers bank there that you could contact to represent training or whatnot that are not affiliated to BAMED per se, but we're highlighting and elevating other people that can represent other viewpoints. So have a look, spread your networks. I always say, if you only ever play football with the same 11 people, you would always think you're picking the best team. But if you're not looking in different pools, you might not know you're not picking the best team. So think about what you can do. It's also really important for you to reflect on not just your HR policies, but your general policies. How does your hair or hair color or hairstyle policy, your uniform policy, your homework policy, your exclusion policy, indiscriminately or discriminately affect people of color or BAME individuals. Are you aware of these discrimination elements? We've seen lots of stories in the news about when people would say, for example, Afro style hair or short graded hair would be referred to as an exclusion because of their hair policy, but actually culturally that would be a norm within some communities. So we need to consider not just our HR policies, but our general wider school policies on how we can make them more diverse and more inclusive. 
In send, again, we would use the term reasonable adjustments. So what reasonable adjustments are we making to make our schools more inclusive? Touched on this just a second ago, but we also need to refer to the optics. Now, optics isn't just the be it and end all. Often people think if we fix the optics, then we're clearly showing that we're diverse. This is this is a very small step that we can take to help address the imbalance between diverse and non-diverse schools. So, for example, some reflection questions for you. Who do you see at the front? Who do you see at the front of assemblies? Who do you see at the front of open mornings, open evenings, all of those things? Who do you hear from? Who do you get letters from? Who's signing off this information? Who are the YouTube clips from? Who are the video clips from on the website? Where are your colleagues in their careers in your current school? Who is in charge of behaviour? Who isn't in charge of behaviour? Who are your heads of year? Who are the academic support mentors? Who are the cleaners? What race? What ethnicity? What elements are you over promoting in some areas and under promoting in others? So think about what the walls say about your organisation. When I walk into a school, I will look at a reception, I will look at the logo, I will look at what's happening. How does that make me feel? How inclusive does that make elements of the classrooms and the school feel? This is what you get if you Google UK teacher. You will find this. This is what a UK teacher is meant to look like. So therefore, people like myself, when thinking about stepping into the profession, would have some doubts thinking, well, should I go into this profession where maybe it's not designed for me? Maybe my chances of promotion are so limited that it's not something that I want to go into. So we need to consider how can we change that message? However, if this is what we get in terms of our leadership, these are the former leaders of our Secretary of Education state position. So then we need to think, well, what's the message that's permeating from the top? And how does my organisation maybe enhance those messages too? What does that look like? If you were to visually depict your senior leadership team, visually depict your staff in a hierarchical order, what would it look like? And therefore, think if it looks like that, it is that. Now consider what we can do to move that forward. And really, really important, and Baymed Network has worked with the um, uh, National Governing Association, has worked with lots and lots of uh, other organisations such as unions, um, such as uh, conference organisers, etc., to think about how can we promote diversity within their organisation. But Ultimately, you need to look to your governors too. Do they represent the community you serve? Do they represent the community they are in? If you're in East London, for example, and there may be 98% BAME students in your school, what's the makeup of the governors? What's the makeup of the leadership team? And then consider how can you then recruit within those communities? Because it's more than just saying, OK, we're going to improve our optics or we're going to look at our HR processes. We need to consider elements within the school that would drive people in and then the students being the main voice behind your diversity. So, for example, how diverse is the curriculum that you're presenting? How diverse is the topic systems, the topic situations, the historical influences? How diverse are your events? Are they inclusive? Are they allowing? Are they welcoming the performances, the support that you offer? How diverse is all of those things within your organisation? Remember, curriculum, the decolonization of the curriculum, the enhancement of the curriculum to involve more people of colour, more BAME individuals, because lots of curriculums right now at the moment are highlighting ethnicity or diversity through the plight of these individuals. So, for example, the slavery movement or um, the Israel-Palestine conflict. But we're not doing enough of actually signposting the significant inputs that BAME individuals have made in our world. There seems to be a market share of BAME colleagues that are represented, such as Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King. Yet we know there should be a huger variety of people that can be promoted in sharing histories and sharing what's happening within the world. This phrase is often used and we need to reflect on it more than just optics. But if people can't see the people that are in the positions of power, how will we want to be those people of position in power? Now, I always say, if you can't see it, can you be it or be it if you can't see it? I'd prefer that kind of phrase. I watched a fantastic film, Hidden Figures, and in Hidden Figures, um, one of the main characters um, approached the um, judge to say, can you be the first person to make this happen? So if you can't see it, can you be the first person to allow others to see it? I know that there are certain groups of individuals that if they were represented at a leadership stage, they're about a 0.3% representative of their whole community. 
they then become more visual and more visible for their communities to then think about how we could step up. So think about who's promoting your post. Think about how you are in your community. Think about do you understand your community? Adrian Rogers talks very much about being involved in your community and being involved in the situations that are happening, not just using diversity as a stepping stone, but actually using it as we are more than just diversity. So get involved with who we are, get involved with what we represent and think about it's not just integration, which means assimilation. Think about how integration means acceptance. We don't use the term tolerance. I don't want to be tolerated. I want to be accepted. I often use the phrase diversity is about being invited into the room and given a seat at the table, not just invited into the room. So reflect again. Are you engaged? Are you experimenting? Are you initiated or are you uninitiated? I've given you lots and lots of thinking points or reflection points for you to consider and have a look at our blog. One of our other steering group members, co-founders, has written a very detailed blog about so you want to recruit for diversity. Have a look at how you can recruit for diversity through those ideas that I've tried to summarize for you all here. Please do check out Baymed Network. On Twitter, we're at Baymed Network. Our website is baymednetwork.com. We have tons and tons of free resources, free ideas, and we're constantly working with large organizations. We've signed the statement of intent with the Department for Education, and we're really trying to highlight what some of the difficulties that our current colleagues are facing. Namely, a most successful one that we've recently put out is a COVID-19 risk assessment. We notice a gap within the risk assessment um, area and we wrote working alongside the NHS and lots of schools, hundreds and hundreds of schools have taken this on and helped their BAME colleagues to undertake a risk assessment whilst returning back to work. So I'm hoping that that's been helpful for you, useful for you, lots of reflective points for you to consider and lots of ideas for you to think about to take back. Just want to finish with this quote, arguments occur when we reach the end of our flexibility. We should always think about how we can become more flexible, how we can incorporate other people's viewpoints and how we can think about integration of our ideas, not just this is my idea and I want you to come on board with that. So thank you for listening. My name is Amjad Ali. I'm one of the co-founders of Baymed Network. Please do tweet us. Please do use the hashtag Baymed and look forward to hearing from you soon. Take care. Welcome back. Just to give you a bit of perspective there, when we were, um, when Amjad was asking me about um, what the nature of this session could be, and, and I always give a free reign to the speakers um, in terms of what their content is, it just gave them a bit of uh, breadth in terms of what we covered so far and the things that would be good if they were highlighted. And then he said to me, how long does it need to be? And I said, half an hour. The reaction was to fit all that in within half an hour is an immense task. And, and I think he did that superbly in terms of so much to look at there. Um, and on Twitter, all the links have been posted um, to all the reports, to all the sections within the BAME Ed Network website which is totally free registration free and the resources are freely uh, available to download and use at your will so without further ado just want to uh, welcome amjad ali to the e stage thank you thank you for having me and uh, thank you so much I, I gave you a herculean task of fitting in so much more <laughs> into yeah. half an hour I mean, I think, to be honest, I was um, more focused on the recording for the person that's watching it via a recording so that they could pause, they could reflect, they could yeah. start, they could start again. The people that are watching it live, apologies, that um, it was so fast. Um, I just really struggled with thinking, what will I leave out? What should I not mention? What should I think? Okay, well, you could read up about that. So I thought if I cram everything in, then watch it um, on Rewind um, on YouTube and take your time. Yeah, and I think moving forward, um, there, there's so many uh, people that are now jumping onto the Chilton Teaching School Alliance YouTube channel um, and re-watching and re-watching and sharing. And um, so many of our colleagues are actually using these as part of their CPD as well as, as, as teams, especially uh, as this is a leadership focus in terms of points of reflection as a leadership team within a school and an organization and i know that our central team for our trust has been doing a lot of work over the last few weeks 
around this and many other things as well. So thank you. Um, so any questions that uh, jump to uh, jump out to you that you want to uh, tackle first? There's been a few interesting ones. I think that uh, that question to do with equity and equality, uh, and I think that one was from. I'll have a look who it was from, um, but yeah. um, it was to do with one to do with the Equality Act, and just uh, as a, a topic area, should we be thinking equity rather than equality? I mean, broadly speaking, um, the Equality Act is about thinking of how we could treat people fairly as opposed to treating everybody the same. So, for example, um, I mentioned the whole cultural influence of things as opposed to bolt-ons being really significant. So, having ramps in schools. Um, to ensure that disabled access is available for anyone should yeah. or anyone that needs it doesn't have to only be there if you have people in wheelchairs that could be someone that is um, in need of those ramps for various different reasons and once it becomes integrated it becomes part and parcel of your package um, it's the same way in send um, and send law we are designed and we're asked to design our lessons by making reasonable adjustments and nobody then says well you're treating that person differently I always use a phrase in my lessons um, which is quite bold that I will not treat you all the same. I cannot treat you all the same, but I will absolutely treat you all fairly. And I think that that needs to be a, a message that we get across, across all of our practices and all of our programs and all of our um, institutions. Uh, I can't treat everybody the same because you're not all the same. If I just homogenized you into one big group, then why is maternity and paternity pay structures different? Why is um, this different for this situation? So we need to be comfortable with getting away from this idea of, well, that person didn't have this or that person didn't do this. And it's not about positive or negative discrimination. It's just about thinking about how we can balance those playing fields to ensure that everyone has an equal starting point. Yeah, uh, just to uh, give a nod, that was Jessica, and she's raised quite a few questions. And thank you for bringing up the disability issue as well. And just on that side, uh, in the same way with BAME and ethnicity, some are visible and some are not visible. Mm -hmm. And so it is really up to the organisation to make sure that they put this in. Just jumping onto the Equality Act, mm -hmm. it, the onus seems still to be um, on the individual to raise the issue rather than the organisation to have anticipated it and to have dealt with it within their structures. What's your view on that? I mean, I think there's some work to be done, especially in terms of um, equality, in terms of race and ethnicity and possibly religious equality. Um, I know, for example, um, every school must, by statutory law, um, display on their school website their disability or accessibility plan, for example. Um, they've got to um, put on their website their send information report, for example. So these things are enshrined in law to make it very pertinent to an organisation that we must know and address the imbalance that our special educational needs students have compared to their non-SEND students and the same way our disabled students or colleagues may have compared to non-disabled or SEND colleagues yet we don't have the same kind of capacity within the element of uh, inclusion around race or ethnicity um, so maybe a, a statement of intent or a statement of intent needs to be part and parcel of a school's HR policies um, if, if that was front and foremost of a school's website alongside those other areas then if you're applying and you're thinking about working at a certain organization you can then go to the website and just look what is it how do they treat the situation what is their viewpoint on it and that could really elevate a person's opinion of what the organization does or doesn't do. Uh, absolutely. We've also got Julia Skinner on here, who's from uh, the head's office, mm -hmm. and she's raised a couple of points. If we if we just have a look at those, I think um, the second point that she raised, um, sorry, the first point she raised was uh, how governing boards encourage BAME and other diversity groups to explore becoming a governor. So the challenges around that side of school structures in terms of governance, how, uh, what what can we do to encourage people to join those governing bodies? So, I mean, what I would, uh, I responded to Julia maybe privately, yeah. what I would argue is that we need to look at, so if, if for example, you're a coach of a football team or a coach of a cricket team or whatever, um, and you've got your tactics, you've got your way of playing, you've got your selection of team, but you still keep on losing, then you've got to think, well, are my tactics right? Is my team right? Is what I'm doing right? 
So if we say, well, we're constantly trying to recruit for diversity and we're constantly trying to seek more appointments to our governing bodies that are from diverse backgrounds, yet we can't get there, then interestingly, insanity and practice have the same definition, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So we need to think, well, what should we do instead? So I would argue, how and who are we aiming our applications to? Where are these adverts going out to? What, what, what's the stream? If it's just the same website or the same other areas, then maybe that's not being accessed. When are the meetings? How often are the meetings? What times are the meetings? How, um, what are the locations of the meetings? Are you immediately isolating certain groups by saying, were well, the meetings in um, a pub, for example, or a, a community hall that's associated to a pub or an organization similar? So it's just going to be step back and look at what some of the difficulties are. And also, like we would do in education, we would get student voice. So get parent voice. What's stopping you from becoming a governor? What are the restrictions for you in becoming a governor for this school? And listen to what they're saying. Is it because the meetings are between 7 and 9 p.m. on a Thursday? Is it because um, actually the location of the meetings? Is it because we don't feel like we'd be a part of the meeting? So ask for that student voice and that parent voice. Absolutely. Just, just looking at through the questions, um, there's quite a few that have come up to do with practicalities within subjects, etc. So things like history, English, etc. In terms of from a curriculum point of view um, and again this is about what you said that we should get to the point where we're not even talking about diversity because it's so embedded so what part does the curriculum have and and also um, I think it was Jessica again um, who raised the thing about um, uh, learning language so obviously we know the issues about timetabling and MFL and getting people to sign up to foreign languages how that opens up different cultures just by learning another language learning about positive models rather than deficit models within subjects mm. to do with um, we're not always talking about slavery when we're talking about people from a, a black background that we're not always just talking like you said in your presentation about uh, about independence and, uh, mm. and about those things and Muhammad, uh, Mahatma Gandhi mm. how do we how do we broach that whole subject of making sure that our curriculums are inclusive so I think the the first stage and the first step that all schools must undertake is that the people that are designing these curriculums need to upskill their knowledge, need to improve their knowledge in these areas. Unfortunately, absolutely, this isn't the case for everybody, but lots of colleagues' versions of black poets would be Benjamin Zephaniah, an Asian poet poet would be Imtiaz Dhaka um, and a black author would be Mallory Blackman and everybody would then say well we've got diversity within our curriculum we've got diversity within um, what we're doing and unless you're aware of the huge variance and the huge um, abilities of different colored authors different colored poets different colored um, people or not just colored but we're talking Romany gypsy traveler authors poets um, etc we won't be able to integrate them into our curriculum. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of focus on subject development. So you'll see CPDs on Shakespeare, you'll see CPD on an inspector called Jekyll and Hyde, all of these kind of things. I guess we need to create more of a climate of CPD within those other areas and upskilling ourselves in knowing what those curriculum areas are and what to do. Secondly, if we think about our knowledge of retrieval and interleaving, then we need to think we've got a huge capacity and ability to be able to integrate a lot more text and a lot more resource into our curriculum. So we've got to be brave, we've got to be bold, and we've got to be knowing about what's out there in order for us to integrate it. And the reality is that the resistance may come from people because they think, well, do I need to design a whole new scheme on this? Do I need to go away from what I've always done? Do I need to now do a lot more work in this area? So at my school, very, very fortunate. We, we're a startup school. We're going into our fourth year now in September. We designed our curriculum from fresh from the start. So we reviewed every text, every outlook, every situation right from the outset. So we were sitting really rather quite smugly during um, Black Lives Matter when everyone was frantically scurrying around looking for more diverse resources and more diverse. Meanwhile, my head of English um, prepared um, lessons that were already in the system. One of my do now activities was um, discuss the differences in um, ability and differences in ethnic um, outcomes of white and BAME colleagues. And, and so, you know, that wasn't a bolt on and students didn't see it as a Black Lives Matter response. They just saw it as, that's what we're doing. We're doing these kind of things and we're learning it. So mm -hmm. 
you could be at that stage, but it's okay to just go, right, we're coming up to September. It's a high effort job, but it's a high impact job as well. And we need to think, how do I work around this? And hopefully if we could then create a community of sharing those resources, like we've got fantastic community sharing resources on Twitter, et cetera, then we can help broaden and lighten that workload up. Just, just to give a nod to obviously Bay Med uh, as well. What work are you actually doing with schools and has that changed over the last few weeks? I said there's people starting around looking for what active work are you doing? And what, are you, what are you able to help with as an organization? to support schools and, and, and I'm just going to point out to people a lot of the work that you do and the resources that you provide have been free um, moving yeah, forward. I mean, um, we, we don't we don't charge for any kind of work that um, we put on the website or whatever what we do reference and this is important and I've written a blog about this recently is that if somebody is a consultant or somebody um, livelihood depends on being paid for yeah. their work then they must be remunerated for their work just like anyone else would yeah. so what we're finding a lot at the moment is lots of people are being contacted to help and work in and to provide support in schools etc but being asked to do this for free yet yeah, those people then need to still eat and pay their bills and all of those kind of things. So we, we're helping BAME colleagues in addressing their worth, but also highlighting that this kind of work might not necessarily be free. You've got to think about your budgets and think about your investment. Nevertheless, BAME Med website is absolutely free. The speakers yeah. charge their own rates. That's up to them to negotiate. We don't take any cut or fee from any of that whatsoever. On our website, what we've realized is that there are lots of people, lots of organizations that are doing fantastic work. Um, and maybe me personally, two, three years ago, would have thought that's competition, but absolutely not now. That's let's highlight everybody. We've got a resource on the website that lists all the other organ sorry not all lots of other organizations that are working towards raising equality and inequity in education. So we work with books keeps to make sure that they can um, so we can highlight their fantastic work on diverse books that are out there. We're highlighting other organizations that are um, promoting a broader curriculum such as the black curriculum. Um, lots of lots of other groups are being highlighted to we want BAMED to be kind of like a, the, the portal hub of these things. Okay, let's go there. What do we need? And then let's seek out and make those things happen. What I personally have found is that Lots of groups that are working towards um, this racial equality or inclusivity um, are very think tank-esque. Um, and so they publish lots of detailed reports and guidance and all of those kind of things. And me as a, as a standard teacher thinks, what do I do with this? What does this look like in my lesson? What does this look like in my school? What does it look like for my team? So we're trying to bottle it down a little bit and say, this is what you can do with it. Absolutely. Um, and, and just dealing with some of the structural things in terms of, and obviously, BayMed is a grassroots uh, initiative that's really, really um, uh, resonated with so many people recently, but also over the last few years. But uh, for fundamental structural change to occur, it needs to come top down. So when we look at policy, we look at, so when a school says, well, actually, that's what I've got to do, because that's what the policy is that's come down from, say, the DfE or whatever, it doesn't highlight. When we get guidance, mm -hmm. rather than things that we have to do, as, uh, as leaders in schools, we do the things that we have to do. Guidance, guidance is always a bit that we'd like to do if we had time. Yeah, absolutely. And hence why Baymed's been around for three years, coming up to four years in January. And the reason why at times it may seem like it's quiet per se is because there's so much background work going on. There's so much policy work going on, um, being invited to roundtables by the Department for Education, being invited to discussions with ASCO, being invited to discussions with National Governor Association, large organizations such as BET seeking guidance and advice, Teach First seeking guidance and advice, supporting massive, massive events such as the Telegraph uh, Education Festival. All of these things are background work that are policy driven that are to help push up from the limit from the people that are making the decisions to show that there's lots going on. Um, so we were one of the signatories on the DfE statement of intent um, and work is ongoing. Lots and lots of doors are being opened up. Um, and what we're doing is once we get the seat at the table, we're then saying here are other people that need to sit down as well. And here are other groups that you need to listen to as well. So um, at times it does seem like, you know, um, what's going on and routinely we'll put out a resource to say, hey, we're still here, but there's tons of work going on in the background.
Well, we've got time for another one, maybe two points. Anything that you wanted to, I mean, there's, there's various things here to do with, again, Jessica said this should be replicated in all schools and how refreshing it is. So it seems like when we looked at Paul Miller's four categories, there's going to be a huge huge number of schools out there that are just starting to recognize this as a way forward that they need to address Mm -hmm. i don't i don't want to i'm not trying to use the word issue i'm trying to avoid that because it's not an issue this is actually a way forward a positive way forward so when we look at communities where like okay it's quite obvious where i work say within luton area Mm -hmm. that where you know there should be diverse teams within our schools but when you go to communities that are say more rural or less diverse what's their motivation to actually even address this when they're saying well my whole community is is white my 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 staff are all white and why does it matter so i mean yeah this this is brought up quite a lot and it's interesting and my my response is usually kind of similar uh in this kind of fashion which is unless your students only want to stay in that community for the rest of their lives and only ever want to stay on that street in that area in that location then okay there is an argument that you could say well you're right then just stay in a little bubble and that's okay or there's an argument that actually if you want to broaden and diversify your minds and diversify your thinking and diversify your experiences then that's the reason i guess it's we're not asking for diversity for equality's sake. We're asking for diversity because it will enrich your life. It will enrich our lives and it will make your lives far um, more uh, colorful, so to speak. Uh, Sorry to excuse the pun. For me, we need to think diversity isn't just, and, and this is an argument that I have with members of my own community a lot. Diversity isn't just about our cultural influences being accepted by others, but it's also about other people's cultural influences being accepted by us too. So, mm. so I shouldn't be expecting everybody to making every kind of um, uh, alteration or adjustment for me. I can too make adjustments. There, this is when we get into the argument of um, arguments occur when we reach the end of our flexibility. So for example, going back to the halal food comment, I can't be flexible about that. I can't choose not to eat halal meat. I can choose to just eat vegetarian food instead though, and that's fine. But if you are a meat eater, you could just eat halal meat and that'll be fine. So it's thinking about how are you making adjustments? How am I making adjustments? And how can we bring these adjustments together? You know, you, you wouldn't go to a restaurant now, any part of the UK, and not be able to ask for a vegan or a veggie option yet I could still go to 99% of restaurants and say, sorry, is this halal meat? And they'll say, no, no, not at all. So it's thinking about what other adjustments, how do we make those adjustments? I live in Reading. We have three Nando's in Reading. Not a single one of them is halal. Yet we've got a massive community of BAME individuals. Yet you think market-wise, McKinsey Report, it will be more profitable for you to just make that adjustment. So it's just thinking about what do we get out of it? What do you get out of it? And it's more than just, because it's a thing to do. Absolutely. And and I think um, just coming to the end of the session now, uh, how can we encourage people from those communities that feel that they haven't got a voice, they felt that they don't want to be the voice or they haven't wanted to be the voice up until now, because you do need people to stand up. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, How do we encourage and give people the platform that they can be the voice when there is no other voice around them? Because it's a brave thing to do, to have to do. And that, that's coming from any background, to be fair. I mean, even from looking at the nine protected characteristics, there are some things that are enshrined in law which seem to have more of an impetus than others. So things like to the pre- pregnancy and maternity and, and the laws over the last few years have become very, very tight around those mm-hmm. uh, where employers definitely do not want to be seen to be discriminatory at at all. But there are certain parts of those nine characteristics that, for example, to do with ethnicity, where it seems to be, well, if somebody says there's a problem, then we'll address it. Yeah. I mean, Um, it's a a worrying situation for, especially talking about uh, people of colour, for example, if you're always the one that's talking about it, then you're always the person that's, oh, this again, is it? Oh, you talking about this again. And... Going back to Professor Paul Miller, um, who wrote um, 
an article for um, a research piece for Belmas, and he talked about this principle of white sanction. And he talked about this idea that in order for BAME colleagues to become more successful in organizations and institutions, then there needs to be an element of white sanction. Now, white sanction is this idea of acceptance and bringing in. Hence why I extended that idea from not just opening the door, but letting us sit down at the table as well. Hmm. And I know this is a hotly contested um, view on things as well about having white allies. So having people that can actually stand up beside you and say, look, we're working together. It's the same way that I can be a he for she advocate, yet we wouldn't be against that. Why, why would men want to support women um, in addressing equality yet we need to consider that actually and this has become more apparent to me as of late especially with the black lives matter movement um, from my black colleagues and my black friends um, that racism is a trauma and if you're constantly highlighting that trauma constantly highlighting the systemic issues and the microaggressions that we're suffering daily it's not something that we want to talk about all the time. Um, mm. So how about other people start thinking about those things? And if you need help and guidance and advice, then we can help you. But really, it's about your learning journey here. And it's about you thinking, how am I going to educate you, myself in these areas? Um, and as we know, uh, through various, various reports that people will work so hard for people that they feel value them. And that goes back to the McKinsey report. If you feel like your bosses, your managers, your um, senior leadership team value you, appreciate you, you will work your socks off. Um, yeah. So if you want a effective, rational, organized institution, whatever your situation is, then value your staff, make your staff feel like they belong there and you'll get the very best from them. And I think that that's probably a, a, a pertinent point to end on. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, in terms of an inclusive statement that that really brings everybody back in and it, and I wish I'd written down the name of the person I was reading an article recently and it was part of her journey and what she said was is that I am tired of educating people that are educated around me in terms of why should I have to speak to somebody who's got two degrees and a master's degree to tell them about what the issues are when they could read it themselves why should i always have to do that and and there is a almost like a uh, you become exhausted mm -hmm. um, it, in that it, process it's a form of fatigue isn't it and yeah. um at the end of the day when is it acceptable to be ignorant around certain issues yeah. um because this whole idea of unconscious i don't think that's so much the case if you're being willfully willfully ignorant when is it okay so, for example, could I say to someone in a wheelchair, oh, sorry, I didn't realize you needed that. Um, yeah. Or would I say to um, someone that's deaf, oh, I didn't realize that you would have needed that adjustment. When is the willful ignorance going to need to stop? Yeah, brilliant point to end on. Um, and I want to thank you, Amjad, for the time. And I know that uh, uh, you've been in the background working as well because you we all are at school. And, and, and I know that you've been... Um, working uh, as some of our colleagues in the past have done in the last few weeks especially the schools are reopened so I, I wish you all the uh, luck and also a safe return to your school environment uh, as we move forward and please make sure that you tweet out anything and just include the hashtag LDNG chat just so our attendees can find it they also do look for them when um, they're uh, watching re-watching it on YouTube yeah. as well one, so, one of uh, one of my colleagues has been tweeting as we've been going along I've seen it furiously yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to stress, just in case I didn't make this clear, I'm not the sole BAMED um, uh, <laughs> network group member. We have a, a large team. We have hubs now that are building across the UK. So it's becoming really big, which is so amazing to see for us. Yeah. Um, from yeah. something that started with just a Twitter conversation to now growing into what it is, it's amazing. So Brilliant. And thank you again. Thank you. Okay. And um, that's the end of another session. And I said, as I said to you a couple of weeks ago, and all the sessions that uh, we've had, especially to do with this whole uh, area that we've been discussing about how do we create a more positive landscape and a sustainable landscape moving forward um, in our schools. And that's from all aspects. Um, I think it's such an important discussion, but also now is a point that uh, actions need to be taken and the the good thing that i've seen over the last few weeks especially is is that schools are actually for the first time working with intent around these issues and um and long may that continue and any support that we as as a trust can give you and also 
all the organizations out there, including BAMED Network, doing fantastic work in actually promoting a sustainable, workable, positive future in our educational sector. So that wraps up another session. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, the last session of the week, and that is with Joe Richardson looking at school improvement and what are the nuggets, the golden nuggets that we need to cherish as we move forward into this new landscape uh, that we find to do with post-COVID, to do with the whole Black Lives Matter agenda in terms of what things can we do to improve our schools. That's the session tomorrow. Do follow us on Twitter at Chilton TSA and as Amjad said at BayMed uh, Network as well and use the hashtag uh, LD Edu chat so we can make sure we can find your comments. Do email us if you've got any requests in terms of how we can support you in whatever subject area that we're covering. Um, not just to do with diversity, not just to do with inclusion, not just to do with representation. All the different topics that we've covered, uh, do make sure you reach out to us or other organisations. We're in this together and we're here to collaborate. And I think one thing that we can say over the last couple of months that we've been running this is the collaboration is definitely the way forward. Make sure you subscribe and I look forward to seeing you at our next session. Thank you. This is Av. Kaushal signing off for another session of hashtag LD EduChat Leadership Development in Education Online.